Father, we ask you to open up this, our hearts today. Lord, thank you for the moving of your Holy Ghost and your Holy Spirit. And Jesus, Jesus, thank you for healing and touching us. Thank you that you're here. Your presence is here, oh God. We worship and honor you today. Make this real to us in Jesus' name. Well, we've been discussing Ishmael, and, and the good thing about Ishmael goes away. And for those of you who maybe haven't been here or don't quite familiar with the story, you remember the story that Hagar was the Egyptian servant that Sarah decided that she was going to send in to her husband Abraham so that they could have children through them because God gave Abraham a tremendous promise that through him all the nations of the world would be blessed, that his children, he would look up in the sky and see all these stars, and he says, your children are going to be more than all those stars. He says, look at the stands on the sea. Your children are going to be more than every grain of sand on the seashore. He says he was going to be a father of the multitude. But Sarah had this decision because, of course, she was quite old. We know that. And she made a decision and, of course, produced Ishmael. And I think it's interesting on how sometimes we make certain decisions and they seem to be little or maybe insignificant, how they can affect other people. And I, I thought this was interesting. This is a story. Many of us, how many of you remember the Pinto growing up in the 70s? Remember the Pinto? Ford made the Pinto. That's their emblem right there. Ford made the Pinto. And it says this, from 1971 through 1976, the Ford Motor Company produced and sold more than 2.2 million Ford Pintos. The automaker set out to make a competitive, affordable car, but late into the development of its design, engineers discovered, now listen, they found this, an issue with the fuel tank. Located between the rear axle and the bumper, the tank punctured and ruptured easily due to the car's design. And if we remember this in the 70s, that they would catch on fire these cars. Ford's engineers recommended an easy fix to the problem, one that would cost an additional, guess how much? $11 for each vehicle. That's it. Just $11 would have fixed this problem. But in spite of this, the company decided to continue with the design as is, both to the cost, keep the cost low, as if $11 would mean that much more and not to delay production. It says this, after a few years on the road, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration began investigating accidents involving the small far car catching on fire, but it took an article from the magazine called Mother Jones to bring to light the Pinto's danger to the public as well as Ford's previous knowledge of it. After losing a lawsuit, Ford recalled the Pinto in 1978 and fixed the vehicles with the original suggested solution. But the sad thing was they said over 500 people died in accidents. And guess what? They were sued for millions and millions of dollars. 11 bucks that they could have passed on to the consumer. <laughs> 11 bucks that probably would have cost them nothing. They made a decision to ignore that. They made a decision to press on and look what it cost. So I know we kind of talk about Ishmael sometimes and maybe some of our decisions are light decisions, but some of our decisions that we make, if we make them apart from Jesus, apart from his will and wisdom, really can have devastating effects. So literally, um, in the Bible, we know Ishmael, Ishmael is the son of Hagar, but figuratively, Ishmael was a decision formed by the influences of circumstances and carnal thinking in an attempt to fulfill God's plan for your life. It is when an individual attempts to follow God's plan in his own way. And many of us have done that. We've gotten a prophecy. We tried to work it out. You know, I've told you this before. I'm, I'm O for O. I always try to figure out how God's going to do something. I hear a prophecy, and in my mind, A is going to happen, B is going to happen, C. God never, ever, ever does it the way I think he's going to do it. <laughs> because 
He has this thing called his own mind, and I can't make him do my mind. He has his will in his mind, and he does it his way. So, you know, we need to learn to hear from the Spirit of the Lord. But there's reasons why we create Ishmael's. We create Ishmael's, number one, because some, we don't understand fully what God is saying to us. You know, Abraham didn't understand. God said, get out of your country. Remember that? Leave your family. Doesn't leave his family. Brings a lot along. Causes a lot of division and strife. Causes problems. But he didn't fully understand what God said. And he misinterpreted it. Uh, another reason why we create Ishmael's is a false sense of obligation. Again, we, heard, we talked about this. And, and if you haven't heard all the series, you can go back. They'll be up on the YouTube page. They'll be up uh, on Facebook. But um, here he was, he set out with his dad, he set out with Lot, and, um, you know, God speaks to him after his father passes away and says, I'm going to send you to a place, you know, I want you to go to this, this land that I'm sending you. And he says, leave your father's house, but here's his nephew. No, his nephew's not nephew, his nephew's a man. And, but still, there probably was this full sense of obligation I need to take care of my nephew. And he takes Lot along, and we know it causes lots of problems, division and strife. A third reason we created Ishmael is guilt, because here God gives this wonderful prophecy that God is going to create multiple, you know, nations through Abraham. And Sarah has a hard time believing that. And she, of course, she's like 90 years old, <laughs> 90 Woo! I always said she must have been an absolutely stunningly gorgeous woman all through her years because, remember, we hear about Abimelech who thinks that she's Abraham's sister because that's what Abraham tells them. And, and Abimelech snatches her up and puts her in his harem. Who snatches up a 90-year-old woman to be in a harem, you know? It's like poor Gami driving down the road and someone snatches her into white slavery. That would be horrible. Let me just turn 90. Carol. I mean, she must have been, she must have been a knockout. Well, anyway, so here she is at 90, you know. And I think she felt guilty. And something that we talked about, because I came from a Middle Eastern background, and Middle Eastern background is a very male-dominated society. Greek background, male dumb, you know, Italian, male dumb, you know, and, and the Syrian, uh, Syrian Lebanese, and, and very much every, all the women. This was like Moses. That's why we got that movie, Moses, you know, when Moses came. It was all the women were always supporting all the men, you know, and because that's the, how it works in those societies. But, um, you know, in the Bible, when they talked about someone being barren, someone being barren, it was always the woman. They never considered, of course, they didn't have the science, the technology to consider that it might be the man that's barren. So here, they're not having children, and Sarah is feeling it's all her fault. So sometimes when we feel like somehow something's our fault, out of a sense of guilt, we might make a decision to do something when really she shouldn't have felt guilty about it at all. But um, so sense of guilt. Another reason we create Ishmael's, um, and we, like I said, we went over all this, is a sense of desperation and fear or impatience. And, you know, I think about how sometimes we, you know, we have a promise from God, we don't see it coming to pass, you know, we do the things that we need to do, and then we just, we get so tired of waiting, we just, well, I'm just going to do this. And it was impatience or fear that we move. And, you know, fear is often masses faith, Right? Because fear can be, fear, fear is energetic, trust me. You've got a bear coming at you in the woods. You all of a sudden get very energetic running in the opposite direction, you know. So fear is very energetic, isn't it? But so is faith. Faith is energetic. Fear is determined, but so is faith. Faith is determined. Fear will make you diligent. You know, how many times when you knew that the test was, you know, or your report was due the next day, all of a sudden, the night before, you got very diligent to write your paper because you were afraid not to have it turned in. <laughs> My sister's pointing at me. That's, I think, part of the reason why I became such a late night, late night person. I wrote many papers very late into the morning. Anyways, fear will make you diligent. But the one big difference is this. Fear you're motivated and dictated to by your circumstances 
and your underlying drive is panic. But faith, you're motivated and dictated to by the word of God and the will of God, and your underlining drive is peace. That's your underlining drive. And faith rests. When you're in faith, you're in peace, and we find that faith rests. But in Genesis 16, 4, it says this. So he, Abraham, went into Hagar. So Sarah has this great idea. I'm going to give you my, my maidservant. We're going to have children through her. So Abraham, of course, I love Abraham. Not one protest, uh, you know, acknowledged in the Bible. No, no, honey, maybe we shouldn't do that. He, she says, I'm giving you my maidservant. Okay. <laughs> Off he went. Not one not one peep from him saying no. Anyway, so he went in with Hagar. She conceived. And when she saw, Hagar saw that she had conceived. Her mistress became despised in her eyes. And we talked about this over and over again, that really Hagar had every advantage. She was coming from, you know, a, you know, a slave girl. She was being elevated sort of to the position of second wife. And uh, she had every advantage but she took advantage of her advantage. And she began to persecute, you know, Sarah. And she despised her and treated her poorly. But I think it's interesting that often we call our poor decisions Ishmael's. But really, I think they should be called Hagar's. Because Ishmael at this point wasn't even born. He was conceived, right? But I think it's interesting that instead of saying we created an Ishmael, we can say we joined ourselves to a Hagar. So sometimes these decisions that we make in trying to fulfill God's promise is we're joining ourselves to the wrong thing. We're joining ourselves to someone we shouldn't join ourselves to. We're joining ourselves to a Hagar. So Ishmael's name means this. God will hear. And in his mercy, and we, we see that after she you know, was persecuting Sarah, Sarah made it really hard on her, and she runs and flees pregnant, and God sees her out there in the desert. And remember, who are, you know, where are you going? You know, who, you know, who, and he calls her. I love this. God calls her when she's running in the desert. God calls her, you know, Sarah's servant. He reminds her, you know, you're a servant. You know, you're not this, you know, she got full of pride because she got pregnant and she began to persecute poor Sarah. But God reminds her of her heart. And he says to her, you know, that he will bless her. He tells her to go back. You know, what was she going to do out there pregnant in the desert all alone? I don't know. Just basically be eaten by wolves, I guess. <laughs> not a great plan. <laughs> Anyways, but and they, she calls, God calls Ishmael before he was born. Interesting, there isn't a whole lot of infants in the, bit in the Bible that were named before they were born. Ishmael's one of them. Isaac was named before he was born too, but so was Ishmael. And Ishmael's name means this, God will hear. And I think sometimes when we make those decisions, and I can think of lots of decisions I've made that weren't the, the, the best ones, that I didn't wait on God, I got impatient, I made a decision, but... I think when we make those decisions and we joined ourselves to a Hagar, that even in the midst of our bad decisions, God still hears us in our mercy, in his mercy, and pours that mercy out upon us. And here was Hagar, who was really had a terrible attitude. She had an attitude problem. And she caused her own difficulties, was reaping what she sowed, and still in God's mercy says, you know, I'm going to spare you and in in your son and, you know, causes a stream to come in the desert and, and tells her to go back home. And he watches over him. God hears us, even in our, out of our own distress. But another thing in, the, in Ishmael that God had to do to finally bring the promises to pass is we talked about how God had to shift the image of Abraham and Sarah. God had to shift how they saw themselves. And a lot of times I feel like in, in our ability to receive God's best for our lives, to receive those promises, we need to stop seeing ourselves after the world sees us, your family sees us. I feel like we're God, where the enemy tries to attack all the time is self-image. All the time. Oh, well, you're insignificant. Oh, well, what makes you think you can do that? 
Oh, well, you're not smart enough. Oh, well, you didn't come from the right side of the tracks. You know, you weren't born in the right neighborhood. If only, don't you love when the devil does that? If only you were this. If only you were here. But oh, well, it's long past any, you know, there's no way that that boat sailed down the river long ago. You know, always telling you about those, trying to discourage us about who we are. God says, God says that you are his children. God says that you are anointed. God says that you're royalty. God says that you are loved. God says that you are precious. God says that there is nothing. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So in the same way, God had to shift the image of Abraham and Sarah, and he changed Abraham's name to Abraham. And Abraham means a uh, high exalted father. And think about it. How many people must have snickered behind Abraham's back when he had this name, exalted father, and he had zero children? But God had to change Abraham's image of himself. He renames him Abraham, father of a multitude. And Sarai's name meant diminutive and small. But God changed her name to Sarah, which means princess. Because God had a plan for both of them. God had a plan. And we know when, when God told them, now listen, and God made it very clear to Abraham after all this time, he says, you're going to be a father of many nations through your wife, Sarah. Abraham laughed for joy, laughed for joy at the promise. But Sarah laughed, but not for joy. Sarah laughed in derision and disbelief, right? Because it tells us in, in Genesis 18 that when the angel of the Lord came and said, by this time next year, eight years, Sarah's going to have a child. Remember, she was in the tent, and she hears this, and she laughs. laughs. And the angel said, why is, Sarah, why is Sarah laughing? And I love what the angel says in verse 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? I want you to think about the promises that God's given you, the prophecies, the word of the Lord, what you're believing for, your healing. Your healing, your deliverance, you know, the, your future, your children, your relationships, the things that you are asking God. How many, like I have a list of things I ask God all the time for, don't you? I have things that I haven't seen come to pass yet. And I think how the enemy tries to discourage us, but this is what I want to say to you. I want you to think about that promise and say to yourself, is anything too hard for the Lord? Is cancer too hard for the Lord to heal? No. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is it too hard for the Lord to restore you to your children in relationship? No. Is it too hard for God to get you a good job, a well-paying job? No. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Nothing's too hard. And, you know, I love how she laughs and Abraham laughs and God decides he's going to name this baby laughter because <laughs> everyone's laughing about it already. Isaac's name, which is appropriate, means laughter. And in the midst of this, God had to protect his plan. After God gave this awesome word to Abraham and Sarah saying in one year's time, you know what he was doing? He was getting their faith out there. He was trying to hook their faith into that timeline so they can start to believe this time, next year, this time, next year, okay, this time next year, you're going to have a son. Three months, right? Because it takes nine months for a baby to be formed. Three months of fertility. So what does Abraham do during the three months when God opens her Sarah's womb? And Sarah is now fertile myrtle, walking around, just fertile myrtle, walking around, ready to receive the promise, right? He goes down to Gerar, and he tells everybody that Sarah is his sister, which is a half-truth, because he is, right, he, he is the, uh, she was, she and him share the same father, but not the same mother. It was his half-sister. But he tells everybody, this is my half-sister, because he is afraid. He makes a decision, not in faith, he makes a decision in fear that, you know, did protect himself because he says, when you read in the word, he says, well, the reason why I tell everybody this is my half-sister is because 
I'm afraid she's so beautiful, they're going to take her and then they'll kill me. So out of fear, he tells a half lie. Now listen, here she is, fertile myrtle, and now she finds herself in the harem of Abimelech. What do you think is going to happen when she has to sleep with this man? The promise He's about ready to ruin the whole plan. So God goes to work and sends Abimelech the most scariest dream ever. He tells him, you are a dead man. That woke him up. I mean, God had to say the most, you know, the most outrageous thing to, you know, wake him up. You know, I got to stop Abimelech. I got to bring sense to Abraham. And I got to protect Sarah because she's in three months of super fertility at 90 years of age. And he wakes up. He says, you're a dead man because you took this man's wife. And he says, Lord, I didn't know. And he says, I know, and I protected you because you were innocent in all this. And God, of course, they returned Sarah. And the great thing, here's Abraham who tells the half lie. And God says, return his wife and have him pray for you and bless him because he's a prophet of God. Even Abraham who did wrong You know, Abimelech was supposed to come and say, hey, pray for me because I did wrong in the vat. And remember, God made a covenant with Abraham. And because he attacked unknowingly God's covenant partner in Abraham. And so he was supposed to um, pray for him. Finally, 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 Isaac is born, the promised son. It says in Genesis 21, 8 and 9, so the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, scoffing. Okay, apples and trees, apples and trees. Mom had a terrible attitude. And, of course, Ishmael had that same bad attitude. And remember remember Ishmael's promise box, promise, you know, his little promise. He was going to be a wild man. And then, you know, he was, he was going to be a wild donkey, and he was going to fight with all his brothers, and it was crazy. This kid, from the beginning, was going to be trouble. Ishmael was, from the beginning, was going to be trouble. And so, uh, of course, you know, they went through the whole thing, and uh, Ishmael then got sent away. It was through Sarah. Sarah said, you know, this son of yours, Ishmael, is not going to receive the promise, but Isaac will receive the promise. And this is interesting. It says in verse 12, when Abraham, of course, is very distressed about this idea because Ishmael is his son. And he goes to God and God speaks to him, 21, 12. But God said to Abraham, do not let it be displeasing to send Hagar and Ishmael away in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. Don't you want God to tell your husband that? I'm going to, like, try to convince God of this scripture. (laughs) Wouldn't you just love God to just say to your husband, whatever she says to you, listen, listen, take out that trash. Go out and dig up that garden. (laughs) Anyways, I think that's funny. Anyways, listen to her voice. For in Isaac, now listen. For in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Yet I will also make a nation of the son of the bondwoman because he is your seed. Listen, he doesn't say to him, Isaac is your seed. He says, in Isaac, your seed shall be called. The seed that's called out of Isaac is the seed of the woman, which is Jesus. That's the seed that's called. Now, I know when you've seen Maybe movies. Don't you love that picture of that baby? I fell in love with that baby. Doesn't that look like Isaac? I think it does. Anyways, um, you know, I know when we see pictures of Ishmael going away. Now, listen, it's a good thing. But we always see like a little boy about five, six, seven. He was not five, six, and seven years old. He was 14 when Isaac, when, um, you know, Ishmael was 14 when Isaac was weaned. All right. Well, no, when he was born. He was 14, excuse me. When, when Isaac was born, he was probably 18 or 19 when Isaac was weaned. So technically, Abraham's responsibility to Ishmael was at an end, right? So I know we see this little boy, and we always feel so sad, but, you know, he wasn't a little boy. He was a teenager or maybe even a young man at the time. 
But God in his goodness, God in his goodness took care of Ishmael. But Ishmael must go away. Ishmael must go away. And in Galatians, it talks about the two covenants. And we discussed that before, how in, Ish- in Isaac, we, it, it is, Isaac is the child of the free woman. Uh, Ishmael is the child of the bond woman. And in Galatians, it just speaks of our freedom, right? Our freedom in Christ, that we no longer have to be bound to the law. And there was, a, you know, it's an example of the law was the example of Ishmael, the bond woman. And here's Isaac, laughter, freedom in Christ, that we are no longer bound by the law, but in Christ we have been set free. So we went through all that. But listen, how do we know the difference between an Isaac decision and an Ishmael decision? How do we know the difference? First of all, Isaac will bring you laughter and joy. Ishmael doesn't bring anything but division, strife, and trouble. That's how you can tell right away. Was this a God thing or it was a human thing? The God thing brings joy, peace, love, hope. The human thing brings, you know, fighting, backbiting, division, and strife, right? We see those two things. So Ishmael must go away. Ishmael will go away. How do we cast off our Hagar's and our Ishmael's to receive your Isaac? Number one, we have to repent. Stop blaming others and God for your decisions. Was it God's fault Ishmael was born? No. Was it Hagar's fault Ishmael was born? No. Was it Ishmael's fault Ishmael was born? No. It was Sarah's and Abraham's fault. And that's the number one, the first step to being free from an Ishmael is own up to your own responsibility and say, they didn't do it. You know, how many times we go through stuff and it's always blaming, well, if they had, and they said, and they said, and God says, no, 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 I don't want you to be pointing your finger and always trying to pluck out, you know, little specks in your brother's eye. You need to yank out that log in your own. You need to own up to your decisions. You did this right? You created it. I remember one time in a particular Ishmael that Pastor Mark and I were going through, and God said just that. He said, Steph, it wasn't Ishmael's fault that Ishmael was born. It wasn't Ishmael's fault. It was Sarah and Abraham's fault. And so we need to, we need to ask God, repent, Lord, forgive us. We made the wrong decision. Forgive us. Do not persecute with your words or actions, Hagar or Ishmael. If anything, bless them. You know, once an Ishmael is born, even though it wasn't God's plan or ideas, God still blessed him and promised to make a nation out of him. He he said 12 princes would come from Ishmael, 12. And so oftentimes when we create an Ishmael or we join ourselves to a Hagar, people are involved. And we don't want to persecute them with our words. We don't want to mistreat them. We want to bless them. God blessed Hagar and Ishmael. You need to bless them as they're being sent away. You need to bless them. <clears throat> don't try to hold on to Ishmael because of feelings of guilt or fear or false sense of obligation. Ishmael is not God's best for you. Walk away knowing that through Isaac, God's promises will come. So, and oftentimes, now you hear that Abraham, you know, the Ishmael is still his son. Ishmael is still his son, and he didn't really want to let him go. But we have to in order that Isaac can be everything he's meant to be. And so sometimes we might be tied emotionally to an Ishmael. <clears throat> Excuse me. We might be tied emotionally to an Ishmael, but we need to let that Ishmael go. Be patient. Make sure that you know all that God has told you before you make a decision. And when you make a move, move in peace. Rely on God's knowing he has ample supply for every situation. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Um, Stephen Covey had a quote, which I thought was really good. I am not a product of my circumstances. And we need to say that over and over again. Because it's real easy for us to blame Well, it's because the reason why I'm this way is because I'm here. The reason why I'm this way is because 
I was there and I wasn't here and this didn't happen and that didn't happen, right? A lot of times, but Stephen Covey says, I am not a product of my circumstances. I am a product of my decisions. That listen, through Christ, you can be anything. You can do anything. You can do all things through Christ as we lean on him. And finally, 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 ooh, we got to hurry finally. Genesis 5, 7, and 8 says, then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Earl of the Chaldees. To, and this is what he said in Genesis 15. When he made a covenant, God made a covenant with Abraham. And the great thing is we have a better covenant now. He says, I am brought you out of the Earl of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit. And he, Abraham, said to the Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? I think that's a really great question because I think that's a question that all of us are asking God about our promises that we haven't seen come to pass. Lord, how do we know? How do we know at what point that we will inherit what we're asking of you? How do we know? And what God says to Abraham, this is how I'll, you will know. He says, this is what, how you'll know that I'm giving you what I promised you, the land to inherit and he begins to tell him to bring these animals, to cut them in half, and then God cuts the covenant right there with Abraham, and we see this smoking pot, which we know is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, that's going through these cut halves. And so what does he ask him to bring? A three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old goat, a three-year-old ram, it had to be three years old, one turtle dove, and one pigeon. And he cut the pieces in half, except the birds he did not cut in half. The Bible says that night fell in a smoking pot. This, we saw the smoke and a burning torch. So here's Abraham. He's just kind of laying there, like, watching all this. He's just kind of out of it. And he's cut these animals literally in half, side by side. And there are the pigeons, and, the, and there's the dove. And here comes the smoking pot and the torch walking through these divided pieces. So why this? It was a common custom of the time period when two parties made a covenant that there was a formal agreement between them. When the covenant was made, the two parties would step between divided animal parts. See, the reason why God was doing that, not that God had to hack them in half and see that happen, is he was doing this for Abraham. Because he was reaching Abraham at a point that Abraham had an understanding. Understanding that this was an agreement between him and God. This was an unbreakable covenant. Not an agreement between a man and a man. This was between Abraham and Almighty God. And it says this. It says, so the parties would walk between the divided parts as a sign of their intended faithfulness to the promises made. If either party violated the covenant, they were agreeing that the, the other partner who didn't live up to it would have the cursed fate the same as the slain animal. That's what they were saying. That's why they were doing this. The fact that it was the Lord rather than Abraham who passed through the animals has interesting connotations. One commentator says this. It is God himself who walks between the pieces. Abraham never walked between the pieces. Only God did it. Only God walked through the pieces. This is very interesting. And it suggested that God was indeed invoking a curse on himself if he failed to fulfill any promise. But given that God is eternal and unable to be divided... It would be a sign of how utterly sure the promises of God are. The only way for the promises of God not to happen would be for God to literally be cut in half. And such is an impossible thing, which means the promises of God will assuredly come true. It is also interesting to note that Abraham does not walk through the pieces. While Abraham and his descendants were required to be obedient to their part of the covenant relationship, the promises and responsibility of those promises fell on God and God alone. The only way that Abraham's descendants were going to be able to take possession of the land of the promise 
was through God doing the work, him and him alone. Listen, we have a greater promise in covenant. You can't, you can't make those promises come to pass. God has promised you that he will surely do it for you, his covenant partner. Because Jesus was the sacrifice. Everything in this covenant points to Jesus. Think of this. Three animals, each three years old, is nine. The, the, the number nine is used 49 times in Scripture, and it means this, divine completeness. It means finality. When God cut that covenant, he wasn't just cutting that with Abraham. He was foreshadowing the covenant that would be cut with the blood of the Lord of Jesus Christ. The pigeon and the dove. Mary and Joseph offered two pigeons or two turtle doves when Jesus was dedicated. The Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus when he was water baptized as a dove. The goat. The children of Israel were to take a scapegoat. And the high priest would pronounce all the sins on the people on the goat, and they would drive the goat out into the wilderness. Again, a symbol of Jesus working out all the promises himself as God, him taking all the sin. You, didn't, you and I didn't even have to take one sin, not one little sin. He took it all. Jesus, when he's dying on the cross, is literally walking through those cut half pieces. Making covenant with the entire world, eternity past, those that are waiting, you know, in Abraham's bosom, and eternity future. He's cutting a covenant. The ram, the skins of rams were dyed red for a covenant covering for the tent of meeting, a symbol of the blood that covers. Jesus was the lamb slain. Passover male lamb was without defect. God provided a ram in a thicket for Isaac himself, future. God required Abraham to offer Isaac, and he provides a ram and said in the thicket. A heifer, a heifer is a female animal. And to to meet the requirements of the Old Testament law, a red heifer was needed to help accomplish the purification for sin. Red, of course, the, the symbol of the blood And here came this animal that was a female animal. Jesus himself was born of a woman. Everything in that covenant about that Abraham walk was about the covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing, nothing was required of us for your salvation, only acknowledging only confessing Christ. That's all you have to do is believe. You have done nothing to wipe one single sin off of your life. You did, Jesus did it all through the power of his blood and his resurrection. God says he, he works the covenant. You just receive all the blessings of the covenant. And as surely as he washed you away from sin, surely, the Bible says, by his wounds we were healed. When he cut that covenant, he didn't just cut it for you to be free from sin and in the family of God. He cut the covenant so you would be 100% whole and well. And he made promises. He made promises to you that he would bless you that he would keep you, that he would multiply. He said, everything your hands touch multiplies, and you you do nothing to make that happen. He works the entire covenant. That's how faithful our God is. Amen.